Chapter Fifteen of the Travelling Thirds by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Fifteen. For two days, Catalina disappeared. Mister Moulton, distracted, appealed to the police. He knew that his wife had been severe, but the wicked words of her utterance were never repeated to him. But Mrs. Moulton, although spiritually debased loved catalina more the better for her condition and protested that no one was so well able to take care of herself even demanding that they move on and leave her in charge of the consul to this mr moulton would not hearken and he and the equally disquieted englishman patrolled the streets and haunted the headquarters of the police the day of the fate dawned and nothing had been seen or heard of catalina over was alone when he saw her the narrow streets were packed with people and turning aside to make way for a religious procession he had become separated from the moultons he walked slowly his head thrown back gazing at the gay and beautiful sight above him from every high window and balcony costly brocades and tapestries embroidered shawls and oriental carpets depended the brown old houses craggy as their high perch itself warmed into life with the flaunting colour in the balconies were aristocratic men and women the latter wearing the mantilla held high with a comb caught back with a rose it was an enchanting sight and above all was the dazzling blue and gold of the sky through the chatter of the good-natured crowd wandered the strains of solemn music and his was the only alien face he was staring upward at a little balcony from which hung a magnificent blue silk shawl embroidered and fringed with white and admiring the mantillas and roses the languid fans and fine eyes above it when catalina came through the window behind and looked down upon him she too wore a mantilla the white mantilla of spanish lace he had watched her buy in barcelona a red rose held it above her left ear and in her hand she carried her fan she had also assumed the lofty dignity of the spanish woman of high degree and she had never looked so beautiful for a moment she returned his gaze stolidly and he fancied she meant to cut him then she bowed said something to one of her companions pointed to the stern brass-bound door below and disappeared a moment later the door opened and he was shown into the patio a shadowy retreat from the glare and noise of the street full of palms and pomegranates roses and lilies with a cool fountain playing and many ancient chairs of iron and wood catalina was standing by the fountain looking as spanish as if these old walls had encircled her cradle she shook hands with him cordially i have had a bad time she said and hated you as well as the moultons but it was unreasonable and i am over it you were as nice and kind as possible and i shall always remember it don't ask me what that dreadful woman said i shall forget it but i shall never speak to any of them again and i should be glad if you would tell them so and that i shall remain here until they leave his mind grasped at once the substance of mrs moulton's diatribe he had given the subject no thought before he turned hot and then cold and involuntarily took a step nearer to the girl with a fierce instinct of protection catalina may have understood for a spot of color appeared on her high cheekbones but she continued calmly of course you want to know where i have been and what i am doing in this house when i left the hotel i went directly to the archbishop and told him as much as was necessary using as passport a circular letter the fathers of the mission of santa barbara had given me he brought me here at once the senora villena has this beautiful house but is poor and so kind i have enjoyed the change i can tell you you certainly are more in your element i am glad it has turned out so well i have been very uneasy have you did you think I had thrown myself into the Tagus or was wandering about roofless with my big grip in my hand? It was my knowledge of your good sense familiarity with the language and winning manner when you choose to exert it that permitted me to go to bed at night Nevertheless you are not the woman to travel alone in Spain. What are your plans? What are the Moulton's plans? 
they have had enough of spain of travel for that matter and they are still in dread of jesus maria they will go from here to barcelona take a boat for genoa and remain there until their steamer arrives they say that italy will feel like home after spain then i shall go from here to granada perhaps i can persuade someone to chaperone me but if not i shall go alone nothing shall cheat me out of granada if you find no one else i shall go with you the red spots spread down to her throat but she lifted her head higher no she said i suppose it does not look right he cursed mrs moulton for shattering the serene innocence of the girl nevertheless something even more captivating had replaced it i shall go he repeated unless i can persuade you to return to america with your relatives then my mind will be at rest but as long as you are alone in spain i shall do my best to protect you if you forbid me to travel with you well and good i shall merely follow that is to say be your companion on the trains in the towns we need not meet unless you wish it you can always put yourself under the protection of the woman of the house and employ a duena but do adopt me as a brother and dismiss all nonsensical ideas from your mind for the first time her eyes fell before his she turned away abruptly you are very good she said come upstairs and meet the senora and her daughter they are charming people a few moments later as they were standing on the balcony she said to him they are taking me to the bullfight this afternoon shall you go possibly but i am surprised that you wish to go it is a beastly exhibition and no place for you i am going she said imperturbably it is a part of spain and i should as soon think of missing a religious festival like this besides i have seen bullfights in southern california you may as well come with us of course cousin lyman is not going probably not very well i will go with you if your friends will have me i must lunch at the hotel with the moultons and set their minds at rest but it is an hour until then would you care to walk about the streets and see the crowd the senora villena was very large and the day was warm but she amiably consented to walk as far as the cathedral in the wake of her guest i have not been out alone since i came to her said catalina with a sigh as she walked beside over up the street at granada i know of a pension and liberty will be sweet again over's eyes twinkled as he looked at the face between the soft edges of the mantilla your new role is vastly becoming i had no idea that two days of old world discipline could effect such a change you look as if you had always walked with a duena at your heels so i have nearly always i never was on the street alone in my life until my mother died you think me improved she added quickly i did not say that i have always thought your bluntness the best thing about you i like the short skirt and covert coat best she said defiantly they do very well to disguise you on the train but if i never saw you again i should prefer to remember you as you are now or as you were that night in tarragona you hardly deserve your beauty you know and then in a new spirit of coquetry born perhaps of the mantilla into whose silken mesh many a dream no doubt had flowed she lifted her chin dropped her eyelashes for a second flashed him a swift personal glance before he could adjust himself to the new phase however she had dismissed it and remarked that she hoped not to meet the moultons and unaccountably perturbed he replied that they were sure to be fatigued and resting for luncheon it would have been easy to avoid them in the dense crowd packed into the plaza before the cathedral waiting for the procession to pass over and catalina paused a few moments to look at the superb goblins with which the facade of the cathedral was hung and then ran the gamut of the beggars and entered the cloister i shall go into the chapel of the incarnacion and pray said the senora villena and meet you here in half an hour no the cathedral of toledo is one of the world's treasures and all the world should see it but for those who would or must read the sights of europe a hundred descriptions of this vast complex dream in early gothic and late renaissance and baroque have been written and the best is forgotten at the end of an hour's visit 
it was almost deserted and over and catalina walked slowly towards the capilla mayor through the rich brown silence of the nave whispering occasionally but overpowered by the forests of shaft uplifting an immensity of vaulting before which the eye reeled the centuries of carving as various as the peoples that had come and gone crystallizing even the broken voice of the moor melted into a harmony comparable only said catalina to the wonders of a californian mountain forest of redwood and pine madronio and oak and giant ferns as delicate as the lace of her mantilla there were high vaultings too where the sun never ripened the moss on the earth and endless cryptograms wrought before the hand of man had taken the message of the gods over replied promptly i don't believe half you have told me about california next year i shall obtain leave of absence and visit it that is if you will be my cicerone why not this year shall i it's all the same to me but i may not be there next year i need europe of course i know that i am a sort of cowboy ah he hardly knew whether to be gratified or not don't desert your ranch altogether nor surrender all the individuality it has given you if you should be the great lady in europe and ranch girl at home what a fascinating combination well i can be anything i choose and on five minutes notice too i am sure of it but which is the real you i think i know then i am all at sea she gave him another swift upward glance but she replied sedately the worst of course that is what people always decide when a person suddenly reveals himself in a bad light twenty other sides may have been exhibited but it is the revelation of the worst that always inspires the phrase at last he has shown himself in his true colours then you are too philosophical to condemn mrs moulton utterly she has taught me the extent of my philosophy so i forgive her and ignore her existence he made no reply for he saw the moultons not three yards away they were in the capilla mayor their necks craned in a vain attempt to register a permanent impression of the gorgeous colouring the phalanxes of saints the riotous beauty of carving on wall and arch and tomb while he hesitated mr moulton brought down his tired eyes and they rested on catalina he gave a sharp exclamation of pleasure and hurried forward his hand outstretched catalina had included him in her wrath but she forgave him instantly and simultaneously conceived a stroke of revenge mrs moulton and jane retreated but lydia ran to catalina and kissed her where have you been she cried we have been just wild how perfectly sweet you look in that mantilla catalina explained and mr moulton drew a long sigh of relief i shall never worry about you again my dear child and now tell me what you wish to do i trust you will become reconciled i shall remain in spain perhaps for some months i have cancelled my passage but i should like to see you again will you come to the casa vilena immediately after luncheon i have a little plan to propose to you certainly i will but is your decision irrevocable quite perhaps i shouldn't keep you now and my duenna must be waiting for me she nodded and turned away but lydia followed and took her arm i can go back to the hotel with captain over she said to her father and the two girls walked down the nave with heads together oblivious to the half amused half sulky man in their wake well what of jesus maria i have given up all hope of ever seeing him again hope do you want to i do and i don't of course it had to end sooner or later but well i was fascinated and there is so little to look back upon however it was great fun imagining what things might happen and all the while to be quite safe under the paternal wing i suppose if i had seen him alone i really wouldn't have kissed him i probably should have run away in disgust but i enjoyed it all in imagination now i shall be rather relieved when i am safely out of spain for i know that he was quite serious when we were running away from alba city and then from alcazar i felt as serious as he did i was really romantic and lovelorn but i took myself in hand when i arrived here and now i am quite sensible again what a tangle 
is that the way people fall in love and out again catalina felt puzzled and depressed life suddenly seemed commonplace love a sort of cap and bells to be worn now and again when convenient well i wish you good luck she said write me when you are really engaged and i'll send you a lot of jewels from our california mines tourmalines and chrysoprases and turquoises and garnets and barrels i have jugs full of them lydia's eyes expanded jugs full they cost frightfully in new york will you really send me some dozens what a fairy princess you are i'm only beginning to appreciate you and now you are throwing us over for good and all good-bye said catalina kissing her a two captain over and don't forget to bring cousin lyman and make no confidences she murmured End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the travelling thirds by gertrude atherton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter sixteen but my dear catalina why of course i cannot go the idea is preposterous now you are talking by the book why was europe made except for the american to play in and refresh himself for the same old duties at home and for a man of your intelligence to balk at a bullfight it isn't that i exactly balk i mean i'm not squeamish and i could look away at the worst part but i do not approve of bullfights and i think it wrong to lend my countenance the bullfight will go on just the same and no one race is good enough to condemn the customs of another see the world impartially and then go your own gait besides you have come to study spain and how can you pretend to know it unless you see it at its most characteristic amusement don't look at the arena if you had rather not but think of the opportunity to see spain en masse at its very worst there is much in what you say but great heaven suppose it ever were known in america that i had been to a bullfight i should lose the confidence of a million people i might be driven out of the church there aren't a dozen americans in toledo and the bull ring holds five thousand people you can sit in the back of the box no one will be looking at anything but the bullfight anyhow mr moulton drew a long sigh he wanted very much to go to the bullfight and away from his family and alone with catalina whom he could never hope to influence in this holiday crowd of dark eager faces he felt almost emancipated and reckless over was ahead with senora viena and her daughter and they were slowly making their way up the calle de la puetaliana towards the plaza ayantamiento they reached it in a moment it was so crowded with cabs and large open carrioles waiting to take people to the bull-ring that there was little room for foot passengers the carrioles were very attractive with their six mules apiece hung with bells and decorated with worsted fringe and mr moulton sighed again before the archbishop's palace a cab awaited the senor viena it held but three seats and she turned with polite hesitation to mr moulton and captain over as they all stood united at last beside it i am so sorry she said but i fear we are going in one of those omnibuses said catalina promptly i am simply dying to go that way with the crowd and of course you will not object senora so long as my cousin is with me the senora smiled very much relieved bueno she said and i will await you at the entrance to the sombra you are a little wretch said over as mr moulton flushed and excited tucked the senora and her daughter into their cab it won't hurt him and he will be sure to let it out to cousin miranda oh i see he laughed and went to the emptiest of the rapidly filling carrioles to secure their seats catalina followed immediately holding mr moulton firmly by the arm but that beacon light of american literature had the instinct of the true sport in the depths of his manifold compromises the die was cast he had weakly permitted catalina to commit him and he would enjoy himself without his conscience 
and it would have been a far more conscience-stricken man than this to have remained unaffected by the gay animation that quickened the very mules the vendors were shrieking their wares men and women their hard faces glowing were fighting their way good-naturedly towards the omnibuses whose drivers cracked their whips and shouted invitations at so much a head and then suddenly in a corner of the plaza appeared the picadors in their medieval gorgeousness of attire astride the ill-fated old nags it was the signal to start the picadors wheeled and led the way to the north the cabs rattled after then the willing mules were given rein and jingling all their bells plunged down the narrow streets to the high road scattering the foot passengers who a motley crowd of men women boys girls infants in arms streamed after on the rough dusty highway they passed one thousand more trudging towards the plaza de toros eating and drinking as they went they were come from the surrounding towns many from madrid and even they led children by the hand and carried infants blinking in the strong sunlight they cheered the picadors who responded with the lofty courtesy of the medieval general on his way to the wars far below there was not a sign of life on the great vega nor in the villas on the mountain slopes all the little world about seemed to be crowded upon the knotted heights of toledo when catalina and her cavaliers arrived at the plaza de toros other crowds were struggling through the entrances but at the door on the shady side where tickets were high there was no one at that moment but the senora viena and her daughter they went up at once the americans and the englishmen as curious to see the crowd as the bullfight as the box was catalina's she had no difficulty to persuade the vienas to occupy the front seats she sat just behind with captain over and in the obscure depths of the rear mr moulton felt himself to be blessed indeed it seems incredible that they bring children here he said as his untiring gaze rose over the rapidly filling amphitheatre no wonder they are callous when they are grown but i'll not believe they can see such a sight unmoved at their tender years i shall watch them with great interest it would be half an hour before the entertainment began but only the boxes were reserved long before the signal nearly every seat was occupied from the vulnerable lower row up to the light moorish arcade through which the sky looked even bluer than above it was a various and picturesque sight to foreign eyes scarcely a woman wore a hat there were many mantillas of a texture and pattern so fine there could be no doubt of the breeding of the owners a few wore the black rebosa but by far the greater number were bareheaded their hair very smooth and ornamented with high combs flowers or pins there were enough handsome spanish shawls on the shoulders of the women this fiery day to have furnished a bazaar brilliant blue shawls heavily embroidered and fringed with white black shawls white shawls red shawls all of silk all embroidered and fringed and it was already a thirsty crowd vendors were forcing their way between the seats selling water out of jugs and wine out of skins and even here the water made a wider appeal than the wine it was anything but a cruel sea of faces hard though the spanish type may be Many a group of women had their heads together, gossiping, no doubt, while the men waited in stolid expectation of the treat in store, signalled to brighter eyes, or discussed the chances of the day, and the talents of the espadas, who would do the bulls to death. They all now take the sacrament, the senora informed Catalina, who translated for the benefit of the two men. Last night they confessed and fasted, and their wives pray until the fast is over. Mr. Moulton snorted, then reminded himself that he was pleasuring, and ordered his critical faculty into the depths of its shop. "'By Jove!' said Over. "'Somebody you know?' asked Catalina. "'Heavens, what a caricature! "'She is a ripping nice woman, and a countrywoman of your own, a Mrs. Lawrence Ruff of New York.' I met her about in london remember now she told me she was coming to spain she's a bit made up but what of that so many are you know you should see london at the fag end of the season a bit catalina lifted her nose with young intolerance her hair looks like a geranium bed is that her son he is rather good-looking 
that is her husband they have been married several years he's quite a decent chap keen on horses he looks older than he is thirty i fancy still i'm rather sorry for him i should think so she must be fifty that is severe of you she's probably getting on to forty-five not more i'm told she was a ripping fine woman five years ago but she has had a lot of trouble all her children refuse to speak to her and she has got a divorce to marry Roth. she's really very jolly if you will excuse me a minute i'll go and speak to her the woman who was adjusting herself at some pains in the next box but one was extremely tall and thin and her blazing locks admirably coiffe as they were above her broken but still handsome face excited the comment of others than catalina she had sacrificed her face to her figure and had reached that definite age when women dye their hair with henna but even forty is an age when the entire absence of flesh makes a woman look not youthful but like an old maid and scarlet hair that would harden a young face is a searchlight above every hollow and patch of manufactured surface in the case of mrs ruff however so distinct was the air of good breeding with which she carried her expensive charms so proud yet retiring her manner and so perfect her taste in dress that she ran no risk of being mistaken for a cocotte she was stamped deeply and delicately with the brand of the new york woman of fashion the difference between whom the same may be said of the small groups of her kind in other great american cities and the average stylish american is as marked in its way as the difference between the parisian and the french provincial indeed the juxtaposition is even more unfortunate for the french woman of the provinces is frankly dowdy and hence escapes looking cheap even catalina in a moment felt her unwilling admiration creeping forth to the subtle charm of perfect poise and grooming the firm yet tactful suggestion of a race apart in a bulk of eighty millions of mere americans mrs roth was talking to over with a great show of animation and her companion a virile good-looking young man evidently college-bred had greeted the englishman with an enthusiasm suspicious in the travelling husband she is going to granada next week whispered over significantly as he took his seat once more beside catalina i have asked if i may take you to call on her to-morrow yes said catalina absently the president of the occasion the mayor of toledo had entered his box the mounted police in crimson and gold to the sudden rush of martial music were careering about the arena driving the stragglers to their seats a moment later came the paseo de la quadrilla the procession of all the bullfighters across the arena to the foot of the president's box the espadas and the understudies the banderilleros and the picadors and chulos all gorgeous in the gold embroidered short clothes and brocades of old spain none of them looked young in spite of picturesque finery and pigtails and their smoothly shaven faces may best be described by the expressive americanism tough but between bullfights they do not live the lives of model citizens and may be younger than they look certainly their calling demands the agility and unbrittle brain cells of youth the president who received them standing bowed with much ceremony and then cast a key into the arena it unlocked one of the dark cells or torils adjoining the arena where the first of the angry bulls was bellowing for light and space and dinner the picadors with one exception retired this hero of the first engagement taking his stand by the door whence all had emerged the espadas banderilleros and others of lower estate scattered at safe distances from the door of the toril near which stood a chulo to direct the attention of the bull to the picador lest he fly first at the unmounted men and disappoint the spectators of their wet of blood but the bull might have been rehearsed for his part as the door of his toril was cautiously opened he flew straight at the blindfolded horse without a side glance or a roar and not waiting for a teasing prod of the picador's pike he bored his horns into the luckless animal's side and dragged out his entrails catalina closed her eyes and turned her back she felt horribly faint then looked at mr moulton he also had turned his back and his profile was green 
nevertheless he had the presence of mind to reserve a small boy of seven or eight years whom he had singled out for psychological investigation the boy looked bored the worst is past for the moment said over to catalina and under cover of her mantilla he took her hand they will take the poor brute out and the rest is pure sport and catalina in a tensity of emotion held fast to his hand during the rest of the performance quite unconscious of the act the bull meanwhile had dashed for the glittering figures in the middle of the arena his red horns looking as if they would rip the earth did they encounter nothing more inviting then came the graceful agile antics of the banderilleros after the chulos with their flirting capes had tormented and bewildered the bull for a few moments first one banderillero and then another received him in full charge leaping aside as he lowered his horns to gore and thrust the barbed darts flaunting with colored ribbons into the back of his neck one man leaped clear over the bull planting his darts in his flight the next went over the wall of the arena into the narrow passage below the front row of seats the bull in full tilt after him but diverted by a chulo before he reached the wall it was true sport and catalina had forgotten her horror and was leaning forward with interest when she gave a sharp cry and dug her nails into over's hand the picador instead of retiring with his stricken horse had leisurely ridden down the arena to see the sport and there he sat serenely the bright entrails of the poor brute upholding him hanging to the ground but only for a moment a young horse could have stood no more and the old hack reserved for the sacrifice by an economical people suddenly sank and expired without a shiver he had not uttered a sound as the bull ripped him open but he had started and quivered mightily he had been dying ever since and collapsed in an instant catalina cowered behind her fan i wish i had not come she gasped into over's ear mr moulton was in need of consolement himself why didn't you tell me i had never been to a bullfight and you told me you were an old hand at it that was only child's play and all the accounts of bullfights i have ever read gave me the impression that the brutality was quite lost in the picturesqueness this is hideously businesslike that expresses it and there is no enthusiasm as yet because there has not been enough blood it will take two more mangled horses to rouse them do you want to go after this act i'd never sit through another but i'll see this through the blood streaming from the wounds in his neck where the banderillas still quivered plunged or darted about the arena striving to reach his tormentors but charged with the swiftness of the wind as he might the leaping banderilleros either planted their darts or as dexterously plucked them out suddenly the president rose and made a signal the chulos and banderilleros enticed the bull to the right of the arena and then the espada of the first engagement hitherto posing for the admiration of the spectators brought forth his sword and red muleta and walking with a sort of jaunty solemnity to the foot of the president's box dedicated the death of the bull to the functionary whose honor it was to preside over this corrida de toros he then walked over to the bull and waved the red cloth before his eyes in descriptions of bullfights especially when the espada is the hero of the tale this final episode is always pictured as one of great excitement and involving a terrible risk as a matter of fact it is deferred until the bull is nearly exhausted he has some fight left in him it is true and an inexperienced espada might easily be tossed but those that oftener meet with death in the bull ring are the banderilleros who plant their darts as the bull charges the legs of the picadors are padded and they are always close enough to the wall to leap over if the bull brings a horse down nothing could be tamer than the final scene in the first act of today's continuous performance the espada danced about the bull for a few minutes waving his red flag and then as the brute stood at bay with his head down looking far more weary than belligerent he stepped lightly to one side and drove his sword through the neck in the direction of the heart a very neat and decent operation the bull did not drop at once and there was no applause he stood as if lost in thought for a few moments and the espada was forgotten 
he had failed then the bull turned wavered sank slowly to earth another door flew open and in rushed a team of four mules abreast jingling with gala bells the bull was dragged out at their tails and his trail of blood covered with fresh sand catalina rose and bent over her duena we will go now senora she said but you will remain of course i shall be well taken care of the senora viena looked up with polite amazement you go are you ill dear senorita it has only begun there are many more bulls to kill i have had enough to last me for the rest of my life hasta luego it was not at every bullfight that the senora sat in a box and she settled back in her conspicuous seat thankful that the very bourgeois senor moulton had accompanied her singular charge as they were leaving the box catalina saw that another picador had entered and stood precisely as his predecessor had done with the profile of his blindfolded horse towards the door of the toril fascinated she stood rooted to the spot some deep savage lust slowly awakening again the door of the toril was cautiously opened again a bull as if he had been rehearsed for the part rushed straight at the helpless horse and buried his horns in his side catalina fancied she could hear the rip of the hide but this bull was more powerful than the other he lifted horse and rider on his horns and the picador amid the belated enthusiasm of the multitude leaped like a monkey over the wall as the torn horse was tossed and fell cracking to the ground well said over have you had enough they say you know that the horror soon passes and the fascination grows i am glad to know it was not my indian blood i can now understand the fascination but i shall never come again all the same we are none of us so far from savagery miss shaw mrs ruff they were in the passage behind the boxes and mrs ruff who was pallid with disgust and delighted to express herself to a sympathetic woman her young husband had sulkily torn himself from the ring walked out with catalina anathematizing the spanish race as they emerged mr moulton green and very silent disappeared when he returned he was still pale but normal once more and after a speech of five minutes duration in which ignoring the finer flowers of his working vocabulary he consigned spain to eternal perdition catalina had driven off with mrs roth he was quite restored and celebrated his recovery by a long pull at a wineskin i believe i am quite demoralized he said cheerfully and then in company with over and young roth whose wife had amiably bade him stay he returned to the ring End of chapter 16. Chapter Seventeen of the Travelling Thirds by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Seventeen. I saw that horse standing in the middle of the arena every time my mind was off guard," said Catalina. "I woke up suddenly in the night with the hideous vision painted on the dark." I thought it was a judgment on me for going that I should be haunted by it for the rest of my life I believe it was Velasquez that banished it, but now I see it only at intervals Perhaps said over we were wiser in going back our savagery was glutted and the imagination blunted I was never so bored in my life as at the end of two hours of it, and I haven't thought of it since they were down in the crypt of the Escorial, in the Pantheon de los Reyes. Mrs. Roth had offered to chaperone Catalina, and after two days of sightseeing in Toledo, had returned to Madrid to prepare for the trip south. She had seen the Escorial, and Catalina had come out alone, with Over, to the grim mass of masonry growing out of the Guadarrama Mountains, which from a distance looks like a phantom casino for dead pleasures they had wandered over it leisurely lingering in the cell with its scant leather furniture where philip the second in his monastic arrogance had received the ambassadors of europe and peering through the little window of the inner cell upon the same sight that had held his dying gaze as he lay where they 
as a great concession were permitted to stand a high mass in the chapel beyond then they had descended the fifty-nine steps into the black and gold vault where lies the dust of charles v and his successors to the throne of spain together with the queens who reigned or mothered kings it is an octagonal apartment with eight rows of niches the kings on the right of the altar opposite the entrance the queens on the left every sarcophagus wrought in precisely the same elaborate pattern is of black marble heavily encrusted with gold the handful of dust that once was chief of the holy roman empire is in the sarcophagus on a level with the top of the altar and below him is philip the second there is none of the picturesque confusion the vagaries of different epochs nor the lingering scent of death of the kaisergruft in vienna it might have been built yesterday but it has the sombre richness the lofty dignity of spain itself there were only two empty niches and the guide informed his patrons that they awaited the young king and the late queen isabella where is she now asked catalina why is she not here oh she must remain in the pudridero for ten years said the guide indifferently it is the custom for some it is only five years but she was very fat thus was explained the purity of the atmosphere they ascended thirty-four of the steps and wandered through that white marble quarry so brilliant so new so cheerful where lie the lesser dead of the house of spain there are rows and rows and rows of them in one octagonal snow-white mass exactly resembling a huge wedding cake the dust of many children has been put away and the gay coat of arms embellishing it seems cut there to cheer the little ones in their last sleep many of the glistening sarcophagi are as yet without inscription awaiting no doubt time and the pudridero above in the sacristia and the anti sacristia they were shown the magnificent vestments and altar cloths with which the uneasy isabella as age waxed and time waned propitiated church and saints and what she had been was discreetly forgotten she had descended into the pudridero fortified with the odour of sanctity they dismissed the guide and walked down the footpath to the lower town for a time they preserved the tranquil silence which is so pleasant an episode in friendship for although this friendship was barely three weeks old they had enjoyed so much in common and companioned each other through so many annoyances quarrelled and made up so often discovered so many points of sympathy and disagreement they had come to take their intimate association as a matter of course while still their mutual interest deepened over stole a glance at his companion as she looked aside into the gardens she had restored the short skirt to favor but to gratify mrs roth who was shocked that so much beauty should go to waste she had bought a gray silk blouse and a soft gray hat still she looked more like the aggressive catalina to whom he had grown accustomed before the brief distracting interval of the mantilla he was well again after these three weeks of almost open-air life much heat and uninterrupted freedom and carried his tall thin figure with military erectness while his keen eyes seemed always laughing and there was a tinge of color in his dark face he now not only looked the handsome highly bred intelligent englishman who might have had an italian or spanish ancestor but his magnetism was alive again and the observant catalina noticed that women stared at him and occasionally lay in wait the hotel in madrid where they were all stopping was full of travellers and of deputies many of whose wives were handsome and dressed like women who looked to life to furnish them with much amusement catalina speculated and occasionally flew into a rage for this trip in spain he was all hers if she never saw him again and she was ready to spit fire upon possible rivals she was not in her most amiable mood today the hotel was on the puerta del sol the noisiest plaza in europe if the throngs that haunt it ever go to bed they must get up again at once and catalina whose rest was broken wondered how spain had ever acquired the reputation for indolence moreover 
it was quite true that the horrors of the bull-ring had haunted her almost to the point of obsession and as she was too philosophical to wish the done undone she took refuge in wrath against herself for not meeting the inevitable with her usual stolidity she prided herself greatly upon her oriental serenity and looked upon her temper as a mere annex which no doubt would be absorbed in time she turned suddenly with a little frown there's an end to our travelling third i broached the subject last night and mrs wrath looked as if i were stark mad she has no snobbish scruples but i suppose the poor thing has never been uncomfortable in her life she asked me politely if i could not afford to go in the looks that runs between here and granada once a week and of course i had to admit that i could but i hate it couldn't we go third and meet her there i'm afraid we have no good excuse and it would take nearly two days by the slow trains i rather think you should be thankful for the solution of mrs ruff you need not preach i am but when i come back to europe i'm going to pretend to be a widow and travel by myself are you so in love with liberty yes i am well i have always thought highly of it myself he said lightly how do you like mrs roth on the whole don't you find her a good sort in spite of her foibles follies i should call them yes i like her if only because she has taught me that a person may be foolish and yet be wise decorate herself like a cocotte and yet be a lady violate half the rules one has been brought up on and yet be more estimable than the wholly virtuous cousin miranda for instance those would be dangerous deductions for some girls but you have a ripping strong head you ought to be as grateful for that as for your beauty i wish you'd stop preaching i never preached in my life he said indignantly i was merely thinking aloud uttering an obvious fact i might add that i wish your temper was in the same class with your good looks and common sense well it isn't do you approve of second marriages never given a thought to the subject if i ever married it would not be with the divorce court among the future possibilities i was not thinking of divorce although mrs roth in a way suggested the question but i wonder how it feels to be married to a second man especially if you were in love with the first and most youthful marriages are for love i picked up an old volume of hawthorne the other day and came across the phrase apropos of a second marriage the dislocation of the heart's principles you never forget a phrase like that and i have been wondering one is so different at twenty-five and thirty-five it's almost like being reborn and so many youthful marriages result in disillusion and disappointment you can hardly blame the victims for taking another try at it there is such a thing as sacrificing too much and i fancy mrs roth has still there is something magnificent in the big gambler and mrs roth must have more courage than weakness to stake all on one throw i don't know that i blame her if she never was happy before but sometimes first love is real love i mean of course when it is mere fancies don't count but if one has any brain and a moderate amount of experience one must know when one has been through the real thing I'm thinking now of two people who have been married long enough to find out It is no doubt as matter for speculation before that and that is the reason so many girls marry and are happy Even though they have broken their hearts several times you see women live the life of an imagination until they can live life in fact But when one has actually lived for some years with a man and loved him and he dies That is what I mean don't you think it is a second-rate person who marries again I have a theory in spite of Hawthorne that mistaken marriages don't count I mean so far as the soul the inner life is concerned But that the real one counts forever and that consolement with another partner presupposes shallowness and a lack of true spirituality Fancy being equally happy and in deepest accord with two men it is disgusting It certainly is unideal and every jack has his jill i don't doubt that don't in the least believe a man could be equally happy with any one of a hundred charming and intelligent women not if he wanted the best out of life 
but it is fortunate perhaps that the majority don't do any deep imagining then you think yourself capable of being faithful to a memory he added curiously i know i could be and happy in a way certainly far happier than if i settled down into a commonplace content with another man it is the inner life that counts nothing else how do you know these things how did you know you would be brave in battle before you were ever in one didn't was awfully afraid i'd funk it well she said laughing perhaps that wasn't a fortunate comparison but one can have intuitions without experience especially if one lives a more or less solitary life and thinks however i have visions of myself as an old maid on the ranch with half a dozen adopted children falling in love is too hard work is it well it always seems so to me she colored more angry with herself than with him i don't pretend to any great amount of experience but you are so ridiculously literal you make cocksure assertions and then get in a rage if i treat them respectfully when i don't you hiss at me like a snake i don't complain however for i am now a qualified and hardened subject for matrimony i suppose you mean that i will make all other women seem like angels you will have something to thank me for if any man ever has the courage to propose to you and you bend so far as to accept him and his courage carries him as far as the altar is it your intention to nag him through life as you have nagged me in the past three weeks have i nagged you she turned her wondering eyes upon him i never so i thought have treated any one so well great god but he was nonplussed at her sudden change of front as he always was there have been times he continued in a moment when you have been quite the most charming woman in the world her wandering eyes were still on his the rest of her face as immobile as the finx he blundered along i have been on the verge of proposing to you more than once why didn't you you have a way of breaking the spell just at the critical moment i'm never sure whether the you i am sometimes in love with is really there or only assumed like one of your rarely worn gowns there are times when i think you have every possibility and others when i believe you to be merely a more subtle variety of the american flirt well i'm sorry you didn't propose she said sedately now i suppose you never will you would have been quite a feather in my cap that means you would not have accepted me did you imagine i would there have been times when i did he was now goaded into boldness well you're just a conceited englishman she cried furiously if i thought you meant that i'd never speak to you again now i know where i am he said serenely this after all is the only you i am at home with well don't speak to me again for twenty-four hours i can't stand you thank heaven there is the train some hours later he found her sitting at the drawing-room window of the hotel looking down upon the most characteristic sight in madrid the afternoon procession of carriages from four o'clock until any hour of a fine night while the national stew simmers on the back of the stove the wealth and fashion and those that would be or seem to be both drive out of the calle de alcala to the great paseos and parks and back through the narrow carrera san jeronimo in an unbroken line that bewilders the eye and creates the delusion of an endless and automatic chain there are more private carriages in madrid than in any city in the world and in bright weather their owners would appear to live in them indifferent to hunger or fatigue those who have paris gowns exhibit them those who have not hide their poverty under the always picturesque mantilla but few are so poor as not to own a turnout a woman of any degree of fashion in madrid will sell her house if necessary her furniture her jewels and live in two rooms with one or no servant but have her carriage and her daily drive she will for to lose one place in that distinguished chain would be to lose one's hold on the world itself so long as they can see and be seen daily in the avenues they love bow to the same familiar faces and criticise the grounds of friend and foe the olla podrida 
can burn and the frock under the mantilla be darned and turned the daughters dowerless and even theatre tickets unavailable they have at least the best in life and then there is always the long morning in bed and the bullfight and who would not envy a people so tenacious of the desirable and so bravely satisfied catalina was at the window on the carrera san jeronimo and there was no one else in the sala at the moment over approached in some trepidation not having been spoken to since the final word on the slope of the escorial but catalina diverted by the bright birds of paradise on their homeward flight looked up and smiled charmingly she wore one of her white frocks and a string of pearls in her hair and stirred the languid air with a large black fan in a strong light she was always beautiful and in the late sun-touched shadows of evening with her pretty teeth showing between the red waving line of her lips she looked very sweet and seductive i suppose i ought to apologize said over who had had no thought of apologizing you did say very rude things but i squared them by losing my temper if we begin to apologize she shrugged her shoulders and lowered her lashes to the hats and mantillas below he took the chair before her let us talk it out he said what do you think is this close companionship of ours going to end in love or are we the usual passing jests of propinquity i admit i have never been so hard hit in my life but at the same time i am not completely flawed perhaps that is only because i am too contented in a way if we were separated for a time i fancy i'd know your sense of humor must have flown off with your national caution i never before heard of a man asking a girl to straighten out his sentiments for him i don't care a hang about traditions if i love you i want to marry you and if i don't i'd rather be shot i am talking it out in cold blood when i can and this unromantic spot with all that infernal clatter down there is as good a place as any besides i don't want you to think that i am not capable of being serious of appreciating you life would be unthinkable happiness if we loved each other you take for granted that if you managed to reach the dizzy height i should arrive by the same train she spoke flippantly but he saw that she had broken the sticks of her fan i told you once before to-day that i believed every jack had his jill if i loved you it would be for what you had in you for me alone i know what the other thing means you are as much in doubt as i am as for myself i perhaps would be sure if you were not so beautiful but there are times when you blind and i don't intend to make that particular kind of a silly ass of myself well said catalina rising i have a fancy we will find out in granada by moonlight in the alhambra and all that sort of thing one thing is positive we are in the dark at present and the conditions are not illuminating here comes mrs roth as she moved off she turned suddenly if you should continue indefinitely in this painful state of vacillation she said sweetly you may consider these two little conversations decently buried for my part i like friendship and we have become quite adept at that end of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the travelling thirds by gertrude atherton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter eighteen this is granada 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 and we are living in the alhambra somehow i always pictured the alhambra as a mere palace not as a whole military town where thousands lived and to be actually domiciled in one of its old streets its old steep narrow crooked streets i don't quite realize it do you i shall feel more romantic when i have cleaned up and someone has stolen my pipe oh i hate you said catalina but she forgot him in a moment she had persuaded mrs roth to go to a pension instead of a hotel and she had heard of one frequented mainly by artists and with less difficulty than she had anticipated for it was the season of travelling americans and her erring but sensitive chaperone was weary of being stared at 
the front windows of the pension looked upon a street whose paving stones and walls had echoed the tramp of moorish feet for nearly a thousand years and are still as eloquent of that indomitable race as if the spanish conquerors had never passed under the gate of justice in an angle at the back of the house was a garden with a long latticed window in its high wall and beyond were the street shade trees of alhambra park there was a sound of running water and a hum of drowsy insects but it seemed as quiet as a necropolis after the long flight from the station behind the jingling mules into granada and the following drive over the rough streets of the city up to the heights of the alhambra catalina's room had windows on both street and garden and she could look down into over's room on the other side of the angle on the floor below the garden although the kitchen opened upon it was full of sweet smelling flowers and rustic chairs and at one end was a long table where a man sat painting there were no palms here for granada is two thousand feet above the mediterranean and the eternal snows are on the sierras behind her i suppose then said catalina after a half hour's dreaming that you don't mind if i go for a walk without you oh do wait i'm quite fit now i'll meet you down in the street on her way through the quaint irregular house she met a tall fine-looking girl who half smiled and bowed as if welcoming her to the pension for a moment catalina wondered if by any chance her family could have bought out the spanish proprietors but dismissed the thought the girl was not only unmistakably american but of the independent class she wore a blue veil about the edge of her large hat and her ashen hair in a single deep curve on her forehead her white shirtwaist and white duck shirt were adjusted with a perfection of detail that suggested the habit of a maid or of time and concentrated thought her features were good and in spite of a hint of selfishness and rigidity about the mouth and a pair of rather cold gray eyes her smile was very sweet but her claim to distinction was in her grooming her beauty mien and in her subtle air of gracious patronage she looks like a princess and yet not quite like a lady thought catalina what can she be over joined her and as the two gray harmonious figures walked down the street catalina turned suddenly and looked at the pension the girl in white was leaning from one of the upper windows but this time the cool gray eyes had no message for one of her own sex they dwelt upon the Englishman's military and distinguished back. Catalina thrilled to the vague music of unrest deep in some unexplored nook of her being. The second response was a snapping eye, which she turned upon over. "'I met an American girl as I was coming out that I have taken a dislike to,' she announced. "'She has a most absurd patronizing manner, and looks as if she were trying to be the great lady, but couldn't quite make it.' I prefer the Moultons, who are frankly suburban. I thought the Moultons very jolly, poor souls. I suppose they have reached the haven of an Atlantic liner by this. Did you see that girl? asked Catalina sharply. What girl? Oh, in the pension just now. I passed a rather stunning girl on the stairs, but there are so many girls. Shall we wander about outside a bit before getting the tickets? The great red towers of the Alhambra were before them and catalina forgot the unknown there happened to be no one else in the plaza de los aljibes as they entered it and the afternoon was very warm and still they lingered between the hedges of myrtle the flower best beloved of the moor and disdaining the upstart palace of charles v looked wonderingly at the featureless wall that hid so much beauty and in its time had secluded from the vulgar the daily life and gorgeous state of the most picturesque court in europe and such harems of varied loveliness as will never be seen again only the tower of comares rising sheer from the northern wall of the asabica hill is as visible from the plaza as from the courts of whose life it was once a part it was from that window that the sultana exalahora the mother of Babdil el chico led him down to the Daro with a rope made of shawls so that he could escape from Granada before his dreadful old father murdered him, volunteered Catalina. But of course you have read all about it. There never was a more delicious book than The Conquest of Granada. 
never heard of it and am densely ignorant of the whole thing you will have to coach me as usual then i suppose you don't know that we should have no alhambra today hardly one stone on another if it hadn't been for irving an american how do you like that you know i have no race jealousy and i had just as lief it had been irving as any other johnny what difference does it make anyhow we have the alhambra it's like bothering about who wrote shakespeare's plays that doesn't interest you not a bit the plays don't much for that matter i'm glad our literature has them but all that sort of speculation seems to me a crying waste of time and mental energy let's have the lecture what did you say your black's name was black bob dill had beautiful golden hair and blue eyes and she sketched the vacillating fate of that ill-starred young monarch while they sat on a bench opposite the great façade of the Alcazaba, that once impregnable citadel swarming with turbaned moors. To Catalina they were almost visible today, so vivid was her historical sense. And, as ever, she caught over in the rush of her enthusiasm. He always invited these little disquisitions, less for the information, which he usually forgot, than for the pleasure of watching the changing glow on Catalina's so often immobile face moreover she was invariably amiable when roaming through history her voice in spite of its little western accent was soft and rich and lingered in his ear long after she had fallen into a silence which presented a contemptuous front to such masculine artfulness as he possessed today after they had passed through the little door of the alcazaba she fell abruptly from garrulity into a state of apparent dumbness but over walked contentedly beside her in the warm and fragrant silence of the ruin except for the ramparts and the two great watch-towers where the moor had contemplated for so many anxious months the vast army and glittering camp of ferdinand and isabella on the vega beyond granada and the sheer sides of the rock on which the fortress was built there was little to suggest that it had once been the warlike guardian of the palace it rather looked as if it had been the pleasure gardens of a pampered harem with its winding walks between terraces of bright flowers its fountains overgrown like the fragments of wall with ivy and its grottoes always cool and of a delicious fragrance while from every point there was a glimpse of snow mountain or sunburned plain after they had rambled in silence for an hour catalina emerged from her centres and suggested that they go up to the platform of the torre de la vela from that high point famous for having been the first in granada to fly the pennons of aragon and castile they saw the perfect rim of hills and mountains that curve about the city and its vega on the tremendous ridges and peaks of the sierras no less than on the blooming slopes of the lower ranges there once were watch-towers and fortified towns the outer rind of the pomegranate which the spaniards stripped off bit by bit until they reached the luscious pith that so aptly symbolized the delights of the moorish stronghold the fortresses are gone but the eternal snows still glitter the xenil is as silvery as of yore while the sloping city of granada itself presents an indescribably ancient appearance with its millions of tiles baked and faded by the centuries into a soft pinkish gray its streets so narrow that one seems to look down upon a vast roof from which crosses and towers rise like strange growths that mar the harmony of a scene otherwise perfect in line and delicate color the solitary tower of the cathedral rises from the mass of roofs like a mere monument above the tombs of ferdinand and isabella who for all they lie in consecrated stone have ever about them the phantom of the ancient mosque above the roofs the very air was pink and out of the shimmering vega to the western hills the sun was seeking to pay his evening visit on the right or north of the alhambra across the river daro was the abaisin on a steep mountain spur once both sister and rival of the palace hill the whole surrounded by high walls three leagues in circuit with twelve gates and fortified by one thousand and thirty towers it was in general faithful to babdil el chico catalina informed her companion thirsty for knowledge and was the scene of terrific battles between that whim of destiny and his unrighteous old father muley aben hassan today it is given over to thousands of gypsies 
who are faithful to nothing but their nefarious and oft-times murderous instincts but by far the most imposing objects of the extensive panorama after the snow mountains were the ruined towers of the alhambra itself besides the three in the foreground and comares or romantic memories was a line in varying stages of picturesque decay extending along the precipitous bluff overhanging the darrow between were gardens of glowing flowers narrow streets ruined walls wild patches of wood where the cliffside jutted and on the south side of the alhambra hill parallel with the darrow the dense park of elms planted by the duke of wellington there is the town of santa fe said catalina pointing to a speck on the edge of the vega ferdinand and isabella caused it to be built when they were in camp the articles of granada's capitulation were signed there and their contract with columbus over there in the sierras somewhere is the spot where Bobdil turned to take a last look at granada and was reproached by his mother who was far more of a man than he was for weeping like a woman for what he could not defend like a man when i was a child my mother used to sing me to sleep with the last sigh of the moor and she suddenly trilled forth with an abandonment of sorrow which startled over more than any phrase she had yet exhibited ay nunca 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 mas vere that means i never 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 more to see she translated practically how close it brings the island of santa catalina undiscovered by the tourists then and our lonely little inn my mother always sang me to sleep in a big rocking chair and my father sat by a student lamp and read frowning until she had finished it all seems a thousand years ago did you miss your parents much asked over curiously for a second it seemed to him that he saw a window open in the depths of her eyes then she turned her back on him i don't live in the past she said let us go down into the park it will be dusk in a few moments and the nightingales will sing they lingered a while among the terraces watching the sun go down then descended through the gate of justice into the park there the steep aisles were dim there was the murmur of running water and in a few moments the nightingales burst forth into song over and catalina sat down on a grassy bank there appeared to be no one in the park but themselves the man looked up half expecting to see turbaned heads and flashing eyes on the towers and ramparts above or the glittering cavalcade of ferdinand and isabella crowding through the gate of justice or the faithless wife of babdil stealing out to her fatal tryst with hamet of the abencerages in the warm duskiness of the wood under the watch-towers and ramparts and the fountain of charles v beside them the music of nightingale and distant waters thrilling the soft voluptuous air it was easy to imagine that the walls of granada had yielded to neither the spaniard nor to time they were the most romantic moments he had ever known and the alhambra is the most romantic ruin on earth the one where the modern world seems but a bit of prophetic history and four hundred years are as naught but there came a moment when he retraced his flight and stole a glance at catalina if she were as thrilled with the sense of his nearness as he with hers in these glades of teeming memories she gave no sign with her head thrown back and eyes half closed she appeared to be drinking in the delicious notes of the nightingales she was quite as beautiful as any of the captive sultanas who had whiled away the hours for their fierce lords in the mysterious apartments above and startlingly like such women white of skin dark and sphinx-like of eye with delicate features and tender forms were sought throughout the east to tempt the sated appetite of the moorish tyrants just so had women with wistful upturned profiles listened to the dulcet tones of the nightingale floating down from the trees beside comares into the spacious courts beneath their narrow windows dreaming of the lovers they would never see how like she was in looks yes but he laughed outright as his fancy pictured catalina as even the reigning favorite of a harem where a mistaken monarch sought to filch her of her liberty and bend her will his abrupt half-conscious laughter rent the spell of the evening and catalina sprang to her feet i forgot to ask the dinner hour she said but it must be time i am starved she walked rapidly up the hill and over followed 
conscious that he had thrown away one of the exquisite moments of life and hardly knowing now that the intoxication had passed whether he would have it so or not End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of the travelling thirds by gertrude atherton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter nineteen they found the guests of the pension at dinner in the garden there were ten or twelve people at the table and over and catalina were conscious of a conspicuous entrance and a certain familiar lighting of the eye in those facing the door heralded them as a distinguished young couple on their honeymoon catalina whose spirits had ebbed far out frowned and took the vacant chair beside mrs roth that at least she might not be obliged to talk to a man and over sat himself beside the husband in a moment catalina saw her mistake there was but one person between her cavalier and the blonde young woman who had inspired her with distrust the american girl sat at the head of the table with the air of a hostess entertaining her guests she was perhaps twenty-six but she had the aplomb of a woman who not only has been a gracious hostess for many years but has exacted and received much tribute she wore a thin black gown which became her fairness marvellously well and had dressed her smooth ashen hair both high and low her long back was straight without effort and if her shoulders were a shade too broad her waist and hips were less mature every one else looked dowdy in comparison even mrs roth suffering an eclipse but if her toilette was triumphant her manner was more so on one side of her sat a frenchman on the other a spaniard opposite captain over a german and she addressed each in his language taking care that none should suffer at the expense of the other and it was manifest that they all adored her she was in fact a brilliant figure and if her sweet smile was somewhat mechanical and her fine gray eyes keen and passionless her swains were too dazzled by her manner and her handsome appearance to detect the flaws catalina cocked her ears but found neither wisdom nor cleverness in the remarks that fell from the thin well-cut lips it was the girl's linguistic accomplishment her bright manner of saying nothing and willingness to hear men talk that were responsible for the delusion that she was a brilliant woman catalina's curiosity could no longer contain itself and she turned abruptly to mrs roth and spoke for the first time who is she she asked have you heard her name is holmes and i heard her sister that dowdy little artist over there call her edith i wonder who what she is nobody in particular i should think but she she dominates everything that is the american girl a certain type you'll see a great many of them if you go about enough this specimen was born with a respectable amount of good looks a high opinion of herself and some magnetism on her way through life she has acquired what some call autorite others bluff she probably has no position to speak of at home she never would wear her hair in that floridora lump on her forehead if she had but she has made a great deal of running in summer and winter resorts and in europe the study of her life is twofold dress and how to please men while deluding them that they are graciously permitted to please her her knack for languages stands her in good stead her tact is almost never quite perfect for she too often makes the mistake of snubbing women she knows the value of every glance she has a genius for small talk and dress probably she has not an income of a hundred and fifty dollars a month and her sister has to dress like a sweep to help her out and i should be willing to stake all i have that she dances to perfection she is the sort of girl that men delight to make a belle of not only because she flatters them and is always all there but because she does them so much credit but they usually are quite content to swell her train and forget to propose what she is on the lookout for of course is a rich husband but every year she becomes more and more the veteran flirt more polished and mechanical and less seductive and will end by taking any one she can get she is a type then i fancied her unique dear me there are hundreds like her 
all the same i can't take my eyes off her she fascinates me i don't like her but i think i'd like to be like her heaven forbid she is a very second-rate person my dear and your beauty is real while hers is only a matter of effect she fascinates you because she is young and successful and you see her like for the first time but she is nothing in the world but a man's woman and while as chaste as an amazon i suppose amazons were chaste has probably been engaged several times the type is sentimental i might add experimental i caught lolly hanging over her this afternoon and she will doubtless put him through his paces it won't hurt him she is not the type that men die for not even what the french call an allumeuse just a plain american flirt she has style sighed catalina of a sort said the new yorker indifferently then she turned suddenly to catalina with the charming sympathy of glance and manner that blinded her friends to the poor ruin of her face how you could rout her if you would she said don't you know my dear that the woman who receives that sort of promiscuous adulation is always the woman who wants it who works for it given a decent amount of natural charm and any determined woman can be a belle but it means more work and self-repression more patience with bores as well as with the wary than you would ever give to it and it means popularity with men and nothing more no depth of accomplishment or interest in anything vital and under that assumption of glorified independence she is really a slave afraid to relax her vigilance lest she lose her hold never daring to be absent-minded or careless in her dress of all the girls i have ever known you have the least reason to envy any one so banish the cloud catalina glowed and reminded herself of the opportunities thrust upon her to be the belle of a season that she had spurned with less than politeness but in a moment her brows met and she lost her appetite over had been drawn into the magnetic current at the head of the table miss holmes was leaning forward as if graciously permitting the stranger to enter yet herself lured by the wisdom it was a comment on the narrowness of moorish streets that flowed from his lips what idiots men are thought catalina viciously i suppose if i hung on his words like that he'd not hesitate a minute about being in love with me but i'd like to see myself End of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of the Travelling Thirds by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty. After dinner, Catalina went up to her room to brush her hair. Her head ached slightly, and sit for a while by herself before the evening walk. As a rule, she was the first to be down but to-night she had a perverse desire for over to come or send for her she was suddenly tired of meeting him halfway of being the frank almost sexless comrade she wanted to be sought and made much of miss holmes might be a second rate but she was an artist and catalina was not above taking a leaf out of her book i'd rather be a hermit and have smallpox than bother forever as she does according to mrs ruff and flatter men not i but i think i should be more feminine and difficult her hands trembled a little as she burnished her hair and once her eyes filled with tears but she brushed them off with a scowl and still refused to think she had been too much with over and their friendship had run too smoothly for her thoughts to have been tempted to revolve about him when alone there were times when she turned cold and then hot if he came upon her suddenly and his touch and glance had thrilled her more than once but she had kept it steadily before her that this was but a summer friendship and that in a short time she would be in california and he in england it is true that her imagination supplemented the separation with a meeting in one country or the other not later than a year hence but she had not permitted her mind to dwell upon the significance of his audible self-analysis in madrid holding that when a man doubted the depth of his sentiments the time had not come to take him seriously 
moreover to speculate upon the significance of a man's attentions was not only indelicate but put her in the class with other girls and nothing distressed her more than to approach the average therefore she had never sought to discover what lay beneath her daily pleasure in over society and her matter-of-fact assumption that for the time he was hers nor would she permit herself to analyze her sense of disappointment tonight her soul had been floating on the high golden notes of the nightingales and not alone it had plunged down with a velocity that left it sick and dizzy but as catalina banged the large pins into her hair she still refused to demand the reason the people were talking in the garden she shut her window overlooking it and sat down before the one opposite the moon had not risen the street lit by a solitary lamp was full of shadows it was easy to convert the shadows into swarthy men with turbaned heads and flowing robes but she was not in a historical mood even a man with a long spanish cloak folded closely about him and holding manifestly to the heavier shadows failed to arrest her attention in spite of her admirable self-control her mind wondered uneasily why over did not call her how he was occupied for the time was passing her eyes wandered to the height behind the albaicin there were lights they might be watchfires it was not so long ago that that turbulent quarter had rung with the clamor of battle of civil strife that its gates had been secretly opened to babdil in the night and his father or uncle been defied to come over and redden its streets what were four centuries i shall always have that pleasure that resource thought catalina arrogantly i can always take refuge in the past on a moment's notice where on earth can he be does he suppose i don't want to walk as i haven't gone down or is he too interested her spine stiffened she listened intently then stood up silently and looked down over and miss holmes were standing in the doorway of the pension talking catalina could not distinguish the words over had a low voice of no great carrying power and miss holmes had neglected none of the charms that man finds excellent in woman but he was leaning to her words in a fashion that denoted interest and oblivion of all else for the moment in a flash catalina realized just how attractive he was to women still talking they moved from the doorway into the street and then down in the direction of the palace catalina leaned out with a gasp hardly believing the evidence of her eyes for a moment astonishment routed other sensations was it possible that over was on his way to visit the alhambra for the first time by moonlight with another woman that he was going for his evening walk at all without her never had he thought of doing such a thing before they went off together frequently alone every evening even in toledo he had come directly to the casa villena after dinner and sooner or later by one device or another had managed to carry her off for a stroll but there he was complacently walking down street with another woman and not so much as a backward glance and the other woman had white lace about her head and shoulders and no doubt looked like a lorelei the only beauty she had ever heard over praise was the beauty of fair women which was as it should be and englishmen laughed at american distinctions if this girl were second class how was over to find her out on a moonlight night in a tricksy frame how discover that she wore her hair like a shop girl doubtless if he thought at all about the matter he would elevate miss holmes above herself in the social scale she at least did not suggest the cowboy and still he did not turn his head perhaps he was only strolling for a few minutes with the new acquaintance waiting for his usual companion to descend catalina leaned farther out in a moment they passed the old mosque and disappeared she fell back from the window unable for a moment to think coherently the blood was pounding in her head her impulse was to run after them and twist her rival's neck 
she panted with hate with the desire for vengeance with the lust to kill she stood like a wooden idol but she boiled with the worst passions of the ancient races behind her she conceived swift plans of vengeance she would make friends with the girl poison her peace of mind kill her if she could not inveigle herself into killing herself the malignant treacherous nature of the aboriginal controlled her obsessed her civilization fell away she was capable of the worst she cared nothing for consequences literally she wanted the enemy's scalp then without premeditation she wept stormily like an undisciplined child or a savage beside itself and then the obsession passed and she was horrified it was not thus her imagination had dwelt upon the great revelation she had visioned love among the stars and had expected groping perhaps to find it there but to discover it in a fit of jealous rage writhing in the most ignoble of the passions her soul shrieking for revenge she descended to the depths of discouragement humiliation she doubted if she were worthy of being loved even by a mere man for the moment she despised the entire sex for over's weakness and inconstancy of course like others he had succumbed to this enchantress who didn't even wear her hair like a lady and was therefore unworthy of even the rage she had flung after him she longed to despise him so hotly that her love would be reduced to a charred ember and thought she had succeeded Then it flamed all through her and she sprang to her feet There is one thing I can do she thought and lit the candle I'll leave tomorrow never will I go through this again and never will I see him again if I can help it she had the instinct of all wounded things and a terror of the emotions that had torn her pain she could stand and had a dim foreshadowing that in solitude she might attain that dignity of soul that sorrow and meditation bring to great natures but never the passionate conflict of emotions that confused her now as she locked her trunk there was a knock on her door she answered mechanically and mrs roth entered what Catalina who was sitting on the floor sprang to her feet her hair was disordered and her eyes red There was no use attempting to conceal anything from this keen-eyed woman whose sufferings were stamped in the loosened muscles of her face She stood silent and haughty she would deny nothing but nothing was further from her mind than confession May I sit down asked mrs. Roth have you a headache I was afraid you must have as you did not come down my head doesn't ache but I am sick of Spain I'm going to start for home tomorrow oh I am sorry it will be dreary without you and I thought it so enchanting here can't I induce you to change your mind Catalina sat down on her trunk but she shook her head I want to go home she said mrs. Roth turned her kind bitter eyes full upon Catalina don't run away she said it is unworthy of you and this means nothing what is more natural he being a man than that he should accept the minor offerings of the gods when the best is not forthcoming moreover when a man has talked steadily to one girl for three weeks she shrugged her shoulders that is the way they are made my dear the way we are all made for that matter as you will discover in time for yourself it is better to accept men as they are and early than late I Never want to see another man again, and this was our first night in Granada There was Had been for weeks a tacit understanding that we should do every bit of it together But you disappeared no doubt he thought you were indisposed I Wanted him to come after me for once Oh my dear men are so dense when they love us desperately they rarely do what we most long to have them if I don't sympathize with you well I think of my own throes not only at your age but so often later it is so easy to fall in love so difficult to remain there you can marry over if you wish and two or three years hence the pity of it 
do you mean that no love lasts in tenacious natures like yours it may nevertheless there will be times when he will bore you get on your nerves when you will plan to get away from him for a time a few years ago i still clung in the face of experience to my delusions then i would have held your hand and wept sympathetic tears now i can only say go in and win but don't break your heart over an imagined capacity of love at an interminable high pitch you must have loved mr roth when you married him said catalina with curiosity and feeling that mrs roth had opened the gates and bade her enter i did said the older woman dryly for what other reason pray would i make a fool of myself and disgust and antagonize those whom I had loved so long what a fool the world is she burst out and writers for that matter They are always harping on the death of the man's love upon the punishment that will be visited upon the woman of mature years who marries a man younger than herself I am capable of the profoundest feeling and I have never been able really to love a man in my life I have deluded myself again and again and invariably the man has disappointed or disgusted me this is my third husband the first died but not soon enough to leave me with a blessed memory the second whom I had found irresistible developed into a gourmand with a bad temper I lived with him for fifteen years when I met Roth I was forty the beginning of the most critical period in the life of women of my sort when if not happy we would stake our souls for happiness it seemed to me that i could not continue to live without love and yet that i could not die unless i had if only for a day loved to the full capacity of my nature when i met roth and he fell head over heels in love with me i was a very handsome woman five years ago i was at first flattered then his ardour struck fire in me and I made no effort to extinguish it It was what I had waited for prayed for and I encouraged it fanned the flame I was convinced that it was the grand passion at last and I went out to Dakota I glorified in the sacrifice gloated over it and in spite of divorce and scandal I suppose I was happy for a time and now asked Catalina breathlessly she had forgotten over and miss holmes never had she been so close to living tragedy mrs roth in her negligee of pale yellow silk and much lace her ruffled petticoat and slippers of the same shade indescribably fresh and dainty and in the light of the solitary candle a beautiful woman once more was to catalina the very embodiment of the world and for the moment far more interesting than herself now i hate the sight of him i am bored beyond the power of words to tell i have to remind myself that he is not my son and when i do not long for my own son who was far brighter i long for a man of my own age to exchange ideas with who will understand me in a degree there are a few women with eternal youth in their souls but i am not one of them I am tired of all his little habits the very expression of his face when he smokes a cigarette with his after-dinner coffee gets on my nerves I am sick of making up and pretending to be interested in the things that interest a young man I want to be frankly myself of course I should hate growing old in any case but I am sick of being a slave that is what it amounts to when you don't dare to be yourself but I must keep up the farce lest I lose him and the world laugh and once more remind itself of its perspicacity I give him a long rope. He is still fond of me. My pride mounts as everything else fades away There you are Catalina had hardly drawn breath during this jeremiad She no longer had any desire to run from her own pain after all what had overdone but take a walk with a strange girl in her own absence she had beaten a molehill as high as a mountain, but she could think of nothing to say in the bitter misery before her There was the accent of finality and comment would have been resented if heard I Have told you all this said mrs. Roth partly because the impulse after five years of repression was irresistible 
partly to show you that the great tragedy of a woman's life is when not the man but she ceases to love better far death and desolation and a great memory than a nature in ruins and the magic that would rebuild gone out of hope for ever as for you congratulate yourself that you are able to feel and suffer as you have done to-night over is a better sort than most marry him and prove that you are of greater and finer stuff than i i should be delighted and if this girl should develop into a rival of a sort welcome the stimulation and show your mettle i won't fight over any man certainly not simply be more charming than she is nothing could be easier you could not make the mistake of eagerness if you tried but you can be obliviously delightful and you know him far better than she does and have no machine-made methods now go to bed and sleep and ignore the episode in the morning you went to bed with a headache and neither knew nor cared what over did with himself End of chapter twenty Chapter twenty one of the Travelling Thirds by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter twenty one. Thus it came about that the next morning, not long after dawn, Catalina was leaning out of her garden window, humming a Spanish air, when Over pushed aside his curtain and looked up expectantly. Coffee? he whispered. She nodded. He pointed down to a little table in the window in the wall They stole like conspirators through the dark house and down to the garden Over was first at the tryst and never had he greeted her with such effusion He held her hand a moment and gazed solicitously into her eyes with an entire absence of humor as he tenderly demanded if she had been ill or only tired the night before and assured her of his disappointment in being cheated of their walk his conscience hurt him and he felt the more penitent as he saw that disapproval in any of its varied manifestations was not to be his portion for catalina looked nothing short of angelic her eyes were a trifle heavy as if with pain but her beautiful mouth curled and wreathed with sweetness she wore for the first time a white blouse and a duck skirt and about her throat she had knotted a scarlet ribbon the fine soft masses of her hair looked as if spread with a golden net that caught the fire of the mounting sun and she looked several years younger fresher more ingenuous than miss holmes though older than herself she ground the coffee while he boiled the water and when he alluded with an enthusiasm that was almost sentimental to their first coffee making in tarragona Recalling the solitary palm against the blue sea her face lit up and her lips parted So all in a night had their attitude of almost excessive naturalness towards each other Dissolved into the historic duel of a man and the maid Both were acutely sensible of the change yet neither resented it for it heralded the new chapter and its unfolded mysteries Catalina had the advantage for she understood and he did not He only felt the subtle change and the conviction that she was even more provocative than during the episode of the mantilla No one in the world can make such good coffee She said politely as she sipped hers and looked through the bars at the dark arbors of the park I Still had rather a headache when I awoke, but this is all I need did you go for a walk last night she held her breath but he replied promptly i walked round a bit with miss holmes that fair girl who sat at the head of the table but the moon rises late and there was nothing to see i was in bed by ten o'clock i hope you will be quite fit tonight so that we can see the alhambra by moonlight together i am very keen on that so am i and she gave him an enchanting smile but without a trace of self-consciousness how do you find miss holmes i long to meet her she attracts me very much oh she is very jolly can talk about anything and has the knack of your race and sex for putting a fellow quite at his ease you are certain to like her she has given up her home life and wanders about europe for the sake of her sister who is an artist 
has a deuced fine nature i should say what nothing shall we take a walk we can't get the cards for the palace for an hour or two yet i hope you will feel like a jolly long walk this morning we really had no exercise yesterday and after that ride from madrid i feel as if i'd like to be on my legs for a week they walked for two hours along one of the country roads behind the alhambra racing occasionally glimpsing many beautiful vistas lingering for a while before the generalife the summer palace of the moorish kings catalina gloating over the profusion and variety of the flowers not only in the famous garden but cropping out of every crevice of the walls themselves as they sat in the warm sunshine of one of the terraces she gave him another little lecture on the history of granada in a curiously exultant voice that made him oblivious of the useful information she imparted never had he been so attractive to her as in this new role of the mere man endeavouring to propitiate his goddess and happiness bubbled and sparkled within her if by chance their eyes met her lashes played havoc with the expression of hers she radiantly felt that he belonged to her she obliterated the future and forgot the seductress she informed over that it was granada spain the golden morning that made her happy and was careful to remove any impression he might harbour that she was making an effort to please him for pride and a diabolical cunning stood her in the stead of experience she merely had put her moody undisciplined side to rest and exhibited in high relief her luminous exultant girlhood and over stared and said little but she was determined that if he did address her it should not be in direct sequence to her wiles for she had a passionate wish to be sought to be pursued she would continue to dazzle him with the jewels of her nature and make him forget the weeds and clay that had inspired him with uneasiness but she would go no further come she exclaimed springing to her feet we can get into the alhambra now and i simply cannot wait any longer do you know she said as they walked down the hill towards the fortress i have had an uneasy sense of being watched ever since i came here i was conscious of it several times while we were exploring yesterday and last night as i sat by my window for a few moments before i went to bed she stammered caught her breath and went on I felt it again and in the night I woke up and heard two men talking under my window I suppose there was nothing remarkable in that but they stood there a long time and one of the voices although it was pitched very low sounded dimly familiar this morning just before we reached the high road I had again the sense of being watched I am very sensitive to a powerful gaze over who was probably afraid of nothing under the Sun was looking at her in alarm you know i have always said that you must not go out alone in spain he said authoritatively and there is danger quite aside from your beauty not only are all americans supposed by the ignorant rapacious lower classes of europe to be phenomenally wealthy but californians in particular and doubtless california is a legend with a spaniard i am not given to melodrama but there is a desperate lot over in the abaisin I don't see what could happen to me in broad daylight and certainly I am not going to run after you or lolly every time I want to go out what a bore not for me I wish you would promise well I'll be careful she said lightly I have no desire for adventures of that sort they must be horribly dirty over in the Albazin and after our experience with Spanish banks it might be some time before I could be ransomed the albaicin might be dirty and abandoned to wickedness but they decided as they leaned over the parapet of the plaza de los aljibes before entering the palace there was no doubt of its picturesqueness far beneath them sparkled the daro and beyond it parallel with the alhambra hill rising from the plain almost to the very top of the steep mountain spur was another vast roof of pinkish gray tiles but here they could distinguish one or two narrow streets mere cuts in a bed of rock from their perch and high balconies full of flowers between the moorish arches a glimpse of bright interiors 
the towers and patios of a great convent where the nuns walked among the orange trees and the pomegranates the roses and geraniums not a sound rose from the ancient city it might have been as dead as the turbulent race that made its history it lay steeping swimming in the pink light that seemed to rise like a vapor from its roofs it looked like some huge stone tablet of antiquity with hieroglyphics raised that the blind might read i shall come and look at this in every light said catalina so if i disappear you will know where to find me they entered the palace through the little door in the non-committal wall and after bribing the guide to let them alone lingered for a time in the court of myrtles where the orange trees no longer grow beside the pool but where the arcades and overhanging gallery are as graceful as when the court was a centre of life in the comares palace first in this group of palaces then through an arcade that abutted into a fairy-like pavilion they entered the court of lions probably the alhambra is the one ruin in the world where the most ardent expectations are gratified from a reasonable distance the restored arabesque patterns on the walls like oriental carpets of many colors and raised in stucco present the illusion of originals and all else except the tiles gaudy in the primal colors on the many roofs which project over the arcades into the courts and the marble floors are as the africans left it the twelve hideous lions upholding the double fountain in the famous court must have been designed by artists that had never penetrated the african jungle nor visited a menagerie and as the only ugly objects amid so much light and graceful beauty serve as an accent rather than a blot upholding the arches of the arcades that surround the court are one hundred and twenty eight pillars so light and slender so mellowed by time that they look far more like old ivory than marble above the arches the multicellular carving again looks like old ivory and through them are seen the gay convolutions of the arabesque on the walls of the corridor above the cluster of shafts at the eastern end which forms one of the two pavilions the florid roofs multiply and rise to a dome of all the colors Overhanging the north side of the court in the second story is a long line of low windows They once gave light and glimpses of history to the captives of the king's harem You must half close your eyes and imagine silken curtains waving between those slender pillars Which were meant to simulate tent poles said Catalina and Oriental rugs and divans in those arcades and the lounging gentlemen of the court and turbaned soldiers keeping guard and women eternally peeping through the jalousies above they must have seen this court read a thousand times muley aben hassan had two of his sons beheaded by this very fountain to please a new sultana and when they weren't beheading under orders they were flying into passions and killing one another and the women could look straight into that room over there where baubdil and the aben sirajis killed because one of them as i told you fell in love with his sultana do you see it all i confess i don't said over laughing but i see quite enough too much would make me apprehensive how would you have liked that life he asked curiously as they crossed to the hall of the abensarages i mean to have been the sultana of the moment of course not one of those captives up there i should probably have been nothing but devil replied catalina dryly it would have given me some pleasure to stick a knife into muley aben hassan and have applied a sharp stick to baubdil they stood for a few moments in the lofty room with its domed ceiling like a cave of stalactites its fountain and ugly brown stains and then catalina shuddered and ran out i can stand courts where murder has been done she said for the sky always seems to clean things up but that room is full of a sinister atmosphere I should commit murder myself if I stayed in it too long The impression vanished and she moved her head slowly on the long column of her throat smiling with her eyes which met Ovas. I Hate ugly fancies and atmospheres she said softly and the rest of the palace looks like a pleasure house 
only i wish there were furniture and curtains it seems to me they could be reproduced as successfully as the arabesques and roofs now one receives the impression that they slept and sat on the floors they were entering the room of the two sisters opposite the hall of the abencerrages once the chief room of the sultana's winter suite there are two slabs of marble in the floor that look like recumbent tombstones what their original purpose was legend saith not unless it was to give an easy designation to a room which needs no such trivial spur to the memory for the ceiling of this great apartment is one of the curiosities of the world the dome is like a vast beehive its five thousand cells wrought with the very colors of the flowers from which the ambitious builders brought their honey sweets it might be a sort of moorish heaven for the souls of bees those tiny amazons who alone have demonstrated the superiority of the female over the male catalina mentioned this conceit and over laughed grimly when women are willing to do all the work he began and then lifted his hat miss holmes entered the room from the sala beyond she came forward with a smile of welcome her manner quite that of a chatelaine welcoming the stranger to the halls of her ancestors i am so glad i happen to be here she said i know you are people whom guides only bore i have lived in the alhambra three weeks now and am thinking of offering my services at the office but you may have them for nothing she included catalina in her smiling gaze i hope your headache is better she added politely yes thank you replied catalina who longed to scratch her she reminded herself of her new role however and gave her a dazzling smile that filled her eyes with warmth and accented the gray coldness of the orbs which like her own faced over how i envy you for having been here three weeks she said i feel as if i couldn't wait to know to be familiar with it all do you live in spain if you call boarding in pensions frequented by artists of all the nationalities living in a country i have been here a year she piloted them through the rooms reciting the information that lies in baedeker adroitly compelled by catalina's intelligent questions to address the lecture to her by the time they reached the queen's boudoir in the torre del pinador catalina noted that the guide chafed visibly at being compelled to ignore the man and it was evident by her wandering glances and the inflections of her voice that she not only admired the englishman's good looks but appreciated his social superiority over the gentlemen of the brush who so often were her portion at pensions here however it was obviously the woman who would be interested in the perforated stone slab in a corner of the floor which may have been built to perfume a queen or merely to warm her and as she and catalina disputed amiably over leaned on the stone wall of the narrow balcony and looked at the splendid view of the albasin and mountain then catalina whimsically determined to give the girl the opportunity she craved her interest in the conversation perceptibly waning miss holmes was enabled to transfer her attentions to the man and with battery of eye and glance convey to him her pleasure in dropping history for human nature when his attention was absorbed catalina descended softly into the long arcade which overhangs the darrow and after wandering about at its extremity for a few moments and getting her bearings sat down on the window seat that looks upon the patio de la reja with its neglected fountain and cypresses they must pass her on their way to the sala de los embajadores she was not sorry to be alone and felt happy and secure experiencing a passing moment of contempt for men in general so easy were they to manage a mood which assails every charming woman at times and even on the heels of doubt and despair but catalina's spirit was too buoyant not to comprehend ideality in its flight and she stared unseeingly at the dead walls and saw only what she had divined in over she waited a long while coming out of her reverie with a start she wondered how long it was and drew out her watch it was half past eleven and making a rapid calculation she was driven to conclude that her cavalier had been absorbed by the enchantress for fully an hour 
she was too proud to go after them but her fingers curved round the window seat in the effort to restrain herself and her spirits plunged into the abyss of dull despair emerging only on jealous and torturing wings to drop again she realized the mistake she had made in the exuberance of her happy self-confidence for a girl like miss holmes can make heavy running in an hour on the steamer and in the various pensions where the moultons had lingered she had often seen what no doubt was the same type of girl retire into a corner with the man she had marked for her own and talk or listen hour after hour and catalina had speculated upon their subjects wondering what one human being could interest another for so long a time without the exterior aids of travel the man always looked as engrossed as the girl and catalina was forced to conclude that the mysterious arts were effective and wished it were not forbidden to listen behind a curtain but only that curiosity might be satisfied she scorned arts herself now she wondered distractedly what this ashen-haired houri was talking about to make over forget his very manners but none of the long desultory conversations followed by the longer silence peculiar to her experience with him threw light on the weapons of this accomplished ruler of hearts although the bare idea that they might be leaning over the parapet side by side in a familiar silence brought catalina to her feet and turned her sharply towards the arcade but at that moment she saw them coming over was a little ahead of his companion who was smiling with her lips and he came forward with some anxiety in his eyes i only just missed you he said i thought you were there in the room lost in one of your silent moods when did you come down only a little while ago said catalina sweetly and she saw the eyes of the other girl flashed with something like fear she also noted that her cheeks were flushed you have got a little sunburned she said with concern for a fine complexion in her voice it is much cooler down here have we time to go into the sala de los embajadores and over was made subtly aware of the second-rate quality of miss holmes's accent they entered the immense room whose dome is like a mighty jewel hollowed and carved within where Balbdil drew his last breath as king of granada and before miss holmes could open her lips catalina with all the picturesqueness of vocabulary she could command at will described several of the scenes of which this most historical room in the alhambra was the theatre not only throwing into low relief the academic meagerness of the other girl's knowledge but insinuating its supererogation meanwhile she missed nothing she saw the girl's colour fade her expression of almost supercilious self-confidence give place to anxiety and as she turned away and stared out of one of the deep windows it rushed over catalina sickeningly that over in the span of an hour had captivated her heart as well as her fancy he must have made himself very fascinating catalina bungled her centuries miss holmes in love would make a formidable rival the girl turned suddenly with mouth wholly supercilious and the light of war in her eyes catalina's face was as impassive as a mask Miss Holmes walked deliberately towards over her mouth relaxing and humor in her eye But Catalina was too quick for her she might be an infant in the eyes of this accomplished flirt But she had imagination and a brain capable under stress of abnormal rapidity of action She had pulled out her watch and was facing over The palace closes at 12 for the morning she said without a quiver of nervousness in her voice it wants but a few minutes of 12 and we never care for luncheon until one would you care to go down and make the usual futile attempt at the poste restante or are you tired tired let us go by all means i have had exactly one letter since i arrived in spain there surely is a batch here i expect rather important ones she turned to miss holmes good morning she said gaily and thank you so much we are the hungriest people in the world for knowledge and she marshalled the unconscious over out he lifting his hat mechanically to miss holmes while admiring the sparkle in catalina's eyes and the unusual color in her cheeks end of chapter twenty one
Chapter Twenty Two of the Travelling Thirds by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty Two. As they walked down the Empredrada, the most shadowy of the avenues in the park, Catalina's ungloved hand came in contact with Over's, and was instantly imprisoned. For a moment, she lost herself in the warm magnetism of that contact wondering somewhat but filled with a new sense of pleasure but as she turned her head and met his steady gaze half humorous half tender she made her obedient eyes dance with mischief beware of the alhambra she said lightly i am not afraid of the alhambra and although she turned her hand he held it fast aren't you you are very provocative she longed for the mantilla which had given her such confidence in toledo but swept him a glance from the veiled splendour of her eyes i don't know whether i mind having my hand held or not but if this were diplomacy it failed he tightened his clasp i am sure that i know you i have heard you say that a good many times you are not very original I was thinking of today particularly why today the wondering expression held her eyes i have never felt more natural nor happy i feel as if the mere blood in my veins had turned to that golden mist we saw on the vega this morning i adore spain she spoke the last words in such a passion of relief that he brought his face closer to hers i believe i'd give my soul to kiss you he whispered there was no humour in his eyes and he looked the born lover and the glades of the sacred grove looked the very bower of lovers but catalina's moment of response was over humiliated and furious with herself she vowed on the spot that she would never again lift an eyelash to fascinate him loved seemed lying in the dust rocked back and forth by her experimental foot he should come to her of his own free will or go whence he came with miss holmes if he chose she would be loved and wooed ideally or die an old maid but to bait to manoeuvre to cross swords with a rival for the moment she hated over and he might have departed on the instant with her blessing she snatched away her hand and was almost running down the hill he made no effort to recover her until they reached the gate of granada and then they walked sedately down the white-hot street together miss holmes it seems has arranged rather a jolly affair for tonight he said a dance in the alhambra in the court of lions she has permission from the authorities and has engaged some musicians the moon rises at ten and we will dance for two or three hours how do you like the idea well enough i am not over fond of dancing I am sorry I hoped you would give me the first waltz well I will if I dance but dancing is not my forte and I hate doing anything I don't do well I suppose you don't dance any better yourself though Englishmen never do indeed how many Englishmen have you danced with well I have heard they don't I flatter myself I dance rather well it would be more like you to judge for yourself i'll see they reached the post office after a hot walk through the town there to meet with the usual official stupidity or indifference at the window of the post restaurant in vain catalina adjured the somnolent person leaning on his elbows to look carefully through the r's and s's and o's he replied that there was nothing but that there might be on the morrow the manager of the pension had already spoken to him they left the post office with bristling tempers it is a relief to hate something in spain cried catalina and i hate the post the telegraph and the banks there is a cab i have had enough of walking for one day End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the travelling thirds by gertrude atherton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty Three. 
after luncheon miss holmes put her arm through catalina's come into my room and talk to me a little while she murmured i'm so tired of all these men catalina had stiffened at the contact but pride made her yield at once she turned with a smile in her eyes and the other girl exclaimed impulsively you are the most beautiful thing i ever saw in my life oh said catalina melting but it was characteristic that she merely accepted the tribute as her due and did not return it in kind the two girls presented an edifying spectacle for the eyes of puzzled man as they walked off arm in arm moreover at the finish of an hour's chat in miss holmes's cool little room they were very good friends for women may hate each other as rivals but like each other as human creatures of the same sex they have so many feminine interests in common that man often dips over the horizon of memory while the mind is alive with the small and normal only to resume his sway when it is vacant again miss holmes sitting on the floor her hands clasped about her knees proved to be much like any other girl and entertained catalina with lively anecdotes of her experience in europe unconsciously she revealed much that evoked catalina's sympathies she made her own clothes and it was evident that her life was harried by small economies whose names catalina barely knew she was a piece of respectable driftwood in europe anchored to a still more respectable sister and the more remarkable that she still was able to suggest a young woman of the leisure class of course i must marry she said shrugging her shoulders unfortunately the only man i ever wanted to marry is a prince without a cent you meet scions of all the nobility in pensions but that of course means that they are as poor as you are i suppose that you independent as you are won't marry for ages i have no intention of marrying at present replied catalina without a flicker of an eyelash lucky you i haven't either for that matter although my prince threatens to descend upon me and if he does she lifted her shoulders again women are idiots when they fall in love marriages ought to be made by the state according to fitness how do you like my scheme for tonight she added abruptly it is a stroke of genius fancy having a dance in the alhambra by moonlight to carry away as a memory are you fond of dancing i adore it it is the only thing i can do to perfection i have actually been proposed to half a dozen times on the strength of my dancing catalina turned cold what an odd reason for proposing a man cannot dance with his wife well you see a man's head sometimes swims with his feet given a man who is fond of dancing and he is apt to think a woman perfection who dances to perfection catalina rose abruptly i must go upstairs and rest for tonight i have been on the go since daybreak thank you for asking me to your pretty room she added with the charming courtesy she had at command you have what the french call the gift of installation and this looks as if you had always lived here i can't even keep my room tidy you have always had servants to keep it tidy for you said the other with her quick sweet smile she shook catalina's hand warmly come in often she said and there was no doubting her sincerity and put on your most becoming gown tonight it will be a pleasure to look at you but although she was attracted to catalina and admired her beauty with the eye of a connoisseur she had made up her mind to marry over her love for the worthy but impoverished prince who had followed her about europe for half a year was a fiction of the moment but over had carried her off her feet she had met scions of the continental aristocracies by the score but it was her first adventure with an englishman of the higher class who looked as if he would love with difficulty and make love with ardour she had held his attention during the morning immediately in the wake of many sensations quickened by catalina and it is possible that some of their exuberance may have overflowed to her she recalled that his eyes had sparkled and melted and dwelt ardently upon her own that his tones had been laden with meaning more than once that he had uttered many spontaneously complimentary things she looked upon catalina as a lovely and somewhat clever child who could have no chance in the ring with herself but she had taken pains to make certain 
that her young affections were not involved she might have hesitated before breaking an engagement it must be added that she cared not at all if over were rich or poor an english aristocrat handsome charming a guardsman her heart ached with the romance of it End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of the travelling thirds by gertrude atherton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter twenty four after supper they sat about the table in the garden until nine o'clock the men and several of the women smoking and there was much talk of art of books of travel gossip of the studios of politics until the day before it had been a party grown intimate through the association of several weeks and tonight at this their third meal the three americans and the englishman glided insensibly into the circle it was a new society for all of them and they were interested according to their respective bias roth was somewhat surprised to find that untidy artists could yet be gentlemen not to say men his wife felt a sympathetic interest in the individual and wondered if all these nice people were very poor and what their particular form of poverty was like she had never come across artists in her charities she longed vaguely to help them in some way without giving offence and then she envied them their illusions their faith their enthusiasm and wondered if the fount of eternal youth from which these endowments flowed washed from apprehension the everlasting pettiness of mortal life over was always interested when he was not bored and catalina pulsated with curiosity and thanked heaven anew for her deliverance from the moltons she had spent the afternoon reading to mrs roth then had taken a nap ignoring over's existence but she sat opposite him at the table and looked very pretty in the candlelight her arms extended her hands clasped her lithe body erect her attitude one of absolute repose the eyes only smiled occasionally above the serenity of the rest of her face once both she and over became conscious that they had drifted from the conversation and were listening to the nightingale singing in the park beyond the wall he met her eyes with a flash in his own but she flashed defiance in response and turned her attention to the German artist who was disputing hotly with the Frenchman pounding the table and apoplectic with excitement Miss Holmes with her admirable skill calmed the raging waters and scattered them into various channels She was in white tonight with a black silk scarf about her shoulders and one end over her abundant fair hair and the eyes of her devotees rarely left her face the prince actually had arrived in the afternoon and occupied the place of honor beside her although she had contrived that over should sit on her left and she had played them against each other or thought she had throughout the evening the prince was a thick-set melancholy looking man of middle years who had some reputation for historical research a position of solid respectability wherever he went and a turn for severe economy his inconsiderable power to add to the gaiety of the world was further depressed by the sense of his folly in falling in love with a penniless girl but he glowered across at over and resolved anew to win her if they had to rusticate on his meagre estate for the rest of their lives she was the only woman who had ever lifted the weight from his spirit made him forget for a moment the contemptible condition into which through no fault of his his ancient family had fallen if it had not been for this condition it is possible that he might long since have turned his back on the temptation of the american girl for he held republics in such scorn that he would not have hesitated to break faith with the citizen of an illegitimate nation as one wholly outside his code of honor and inherited sense of conduct but this girl had brought sweetness into his life and he was grateful to her and in his manner loved her she had considered him in her clear-eyed fashion had pictured herself as his companion well loved no doubt and with the entree to the best intellectual society on the continent but she knew him to be far more selfish than any man she had ever met and with a pride which 
no matter how he might love and admire her would never permit him to forget that he was a prince and she a plebeian it is only just to add that she might have belonged to the flower of american aristocracy and he would have made no distinction it was always a risk for an american woman to marry a european aristocrat with his uncontrollable sense of social superiority not only over the inhabitants of the united states of america but over those of every other nation but his own and to marry one who took life seriously and was as poor as a church mouse was nothing short of foolhardy but a prince was a prince even if he were not the head of his family and to become an indisputable princess was a great temptation to the self-made american girl had been until she met over now she would have sacrificed a prince of the blood with a malachite mine in russia she had made herself very charming to over throughout the evening drawing him out showing him to the others at his best and he had been somewhat stimulated by the dull glow in the black opaque eyes opposite as they separated to dress for the party he asked catalina once more to give him the initial dance and when she refused positively he immediately and eagerly asked the same favor of miss holmes after a moment's sprightly thought and hesitation he was gratified like most englishmen of his class he was fond of dancing although he regarded it as a sort of poetical exercise and on the whole preferred golf and one good dancer was much the same to him as another he was far too practical to feed any desire to hold a particular girl in his arms in a public room where other men held other girls in conventional embrace but this catalina could not know and ran up to her room angry and hurt nevertheless she dressed herself with elaborate care in an evening gown recently made in paris a white chiffon spangled with gold it revealed the slim roundness of her neck and arms and clasped her beautiful figure like mere drapery on a statue she put a white rose on either side of the mass of hair she always wore low on her neck and found a long scarf of golden tissue to protect her when the night grew chill when she joined the others in the sala there was a murmur of admiration rising high among the artists which she received with absolute stolidity over came forward at once what next he murmured you surpass my expectations i can say no more than that but you must put that scarf about your shoulders directly you go out or you will take cold practical englishman i never had a cold in my life wonderful young person put it on at once we are starting miss holmes looked like a lorelei with an american education in pale green her sister was draped in sage green and the other artist of her sex in red and yellow spanish shawls mrs roth wore an elaborate blue gown with an air of doing the occasion all the honor possible over roth and the prince wore the conventional evening dress the foreign artists were in their velvet jackets with the one exception of the german who had got himself up in the property costume of a spanish grandee miss holmes draped a white lace shawl about her head and shoulders come she said it is time to start and she led the way down the dark street with her prince she was to dance many times with over and amiably gave the brief interval to the admirer who was much too serious for even the stately quadrille over and catalina brought up the rear she drew close to him with a little shiver i still have that sense of being watched she said i can't understand why i should be so silly as to notice it I'm usually afraid of nothing never had a nerve before But she did understand and resented Over had roused and quickened all her femininity and she longed for his protection Wondered at her former boy-like indifference to sympathy as to peril Over drew her hand through his arm it may be nothing and it may mean a good deal Mind you do not wander off by yourself in the palace if you do I shall be hunting for you and that will spoil my evening this dance has upset our plans but we must have a stroll together through some of those old courts and corridors before the party breaks up end of chapter 24
Chapter Twenty Five of the Travelling Thirds by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty Five. The moon hung directly over the tower of Comares. In the arcade beside the room of the two sisters was a mass of bright cushions and an oriental carpet. Here Mrs. Roth enthroned herself, and the melancholy and disgusted prince kept her company. The musicians fiddled and strummed in the pavilion at the top of the court. Wind was rising in the trees and the steep hillside above the darrow, and the nightingales sang. The great rooms around the court, the low chambers above, were black with shadow, but the open spaces about the lions were lively with whirling figures and the chatter of women. The original party, which was too rich in men, had been reinforced by several American girls from another pension, and all had entered into the gay spirit of the night except catalina who stood alone in the pavilion opposite the musicians frankly miserable and furious with herself for daring to suffer over had danced no less than six times with miss holmes whose dancing would throw a hebe out of court she was the triumphant belle of the evening no sultana in her little hour had ever held prouder sway in these halls of the moors and where they indeed had been glad of one doubtfully devoted heart she was lightly spurning half a dozen the men importuned her between dances the foreigners extravagant in their admiration over consoling himself with manifest discontent when she gave her hand to another he had just completed his sixth waltz with her when catalina had her inspiration he had not looked at her since the dancing began there was only one way in which she could compel his attention and although her shyness rose to arms her knees shook and her breath came short she set her teeth and glided down the arcade to the pavilion of the musicians it had been understood that after the first hour and a half there was to be an interval for lemonade and sweets and rest during which they would sit on the cushions and admire the opposite arcade and the airy grace of the pavilions under the light of the moon it must have been here that muley aben hassein and baugdil used to sit with their courts while the minstrels or whatever they were in those days tried to amuse them and the nauch girls danced and the captives above envied the captives below miss holmes was beginning as they arranged the cushions when several of the party gave a low cry and the hostess paused with her mouth open a figure had risen before them in the moonlight slim young veiled the very idola of those foreign women the number of whose heartbeats had depended upon the nod of a tyrannical voluptuary only her eyes long dark expressionless were revealed above the gold tissue of her veil and over alone recognized her instantly he had missed her as they assembled and was about to go in search of her when she appeared he held his breath and the others one or two of the girls giggling hysterically hardly knew whether to be frightened or not Then the low soft dreaming strains of music crept over to them and she began to dance She had known the old Spanish dances all her life and loved them with all the wild blood in her Despising the more conventional whirl of the drawing-room She danced none of these tonight however, but an improvisation born of her knowledge of Moorish traditions the place and the hour as over realized what she purposed he stepped forward with the intention of stopping the performance enraged that other men should be in the audience but arrested by his distaste of a scene in a moment he sank down on his cushions wondering that he had doubted her for it was apparent even in the first few moments that in spite of the graceful abandon of her dancing there was to be nothing to suggest the coarseness of the women that had danced on that spot before her But if the swinging and swaying and bending and whirling of her body were without suggestiveness They were the very poetry of beauty The scarf was bound about her head and over her face below the eyes and she held a point in either hand her arms sometimes extended at others describing curves that made the delicate tissue flutter like the many wings of tiny birds the spangles on her dress the diamond buckles on her slippers were one thousand points of light 
for the moon was poised directly overhead and flooding the court the perfume of the scarf stole into the senses of the staring company and completed the illusion delicately brushing with sensuousness what was otherwise an expression of the rhythm of life the dreaming of an ardent but virginal soul so an art girl might have danced for the first time before a king ignorant then of what was expected of her dissolving in the joy of rhythmical motion of innocent pride in her own young beauty the arches between the company and the dancer the fountain above the lions rising in a silver veil behind her and beyond it the white shining arches with their moving shadows the distant warbling of the nightingales rising above the swooning music the oriental mystery in the eyes above the veil not one of her audience but surrendered himself although in superficial fashion all had recognized her and then while their senses were locked while they were hardly conscious whether they slept or waked a strange and terrible thing happened from the room of the two sisters beside them the figure of a man leaped like a sword from its scabbard caught the dancer in his arms and disappeared whence it had come there was a fatal moment of incredulity then over leaped to his feet and ran into the dark room but he had no idea which way to turn and had lost himself in the sala de los ajimeses beyond which he heard miss holmes's cry sharply he mustn't go alone and at least i know every foot of the palace the man will make for the underground rooms or climb out of the windows and down the hill of the albaicin the word completed over's horror but as he hastily rejoined the party now voluble in the room of the two sisters he dispatched wrath and the spanish artist for the police and then with little ceremony ordered miss holmes to lead the way catalina in that leap from the dark room to her swaying form dreamy with its own motion had recognized jesus maria but in the swift flight that followed her face was pressed so hard against his shoulder that she could neither see nor cry out her feet struck against narrow walls but her arms were pinioned in that strong deft embrace and rage inwardly as she might he controlled her as easily as if she were bound with cords it was only when she felt him lift her slightly as he vaulted over a window ledge that she found her opportunity with a swift writhe of her body she freed her hands and beat upon his face with all her strength which was not inconsiderable he was stumbling down the steep declivity below the comaris tower and he paused a moment to take breath what do you want she cried furiously money he pressed his left hand over her mouth and dexterously caught both her hands in his right yes he said grimly the senor your uncle can bring that with the golden senorita it is you or she and the money too keep quiet he said violently if you cry out i will run a nail through your tongue catalina knew there was no time for any such ceremony at the moment and the moment was all she had with another sharp wrench she freed her head and hands struggled to press her knee against his chest and clawed his face with her sharp nails the cliff was but little off the perpendicular irregular of surface and a wilderness of high shrubs rocks and trees for a man to make the descent in daylight and unencumbered was no mean feat but to endeavor to accomplish this at night the moon hidden more often than not by the trees and comares with a struggling woman in his arms tried even the superb strength and skill of the catalan he set her down and attempted to wind the long scarf more tightly about her mouth and throat and to bind her hands but she was too quick for him she made no attempt to run away knowing the futility but she braced herself against a rock and fought him she felt not a spasm of fear but she thrilled with the consciousness that she fought for more than her liberty undefiled she fought for freedom to fly back to over and have an end of subterfuge and illusion in those moments as she fought and kicked and scratched like a wildcat she had a vivid and serene vision of herself as over's wife she knew it to be a writ as clearly as if the hand of destiny traced it on the silver disc above and while her body obeyed its primal instincts her soul sang the catalan was desperate he cursed his folly in not stationing his confederate on the darrow instead of in the hovel in the albaicin 
but he had feared confusion and felt contemptuously sure of his ability to manage a mere girl but he had had no experience of girls whom ranch life had made vigorous and fearless and whose fathers had taught them the principles of boxing catalina parried his attempts to give her a stunning blow as deftly as she filled her nails with his skin and hair and she was so well braced he could not trip her once he made a sudden dive for her feet with his hands but she leaped aside and his nose came in contact with the rock suddenly he turned his head far above in the windows of the hall of the ambassadors from which he had made his escape he heard the sound of voices that moment was his undoing with the leap of a panther catalina was on his back she pressed her knees into his sides dragged his head back with one arm while with the other she pounded his unprotected face she gave a mighty shake but he might as well have attempted to throw off a wildcat of her own forests he might exhaust her in time but so long as she had strength she would hang on and with a low roar that portended hideous vengeance he started once more down the bluff as edith holmes led the race through the many corridors and apartments that lay between the court and the hall of the ambassadors she knew that the game was hers if she chose to play it there was but one place in granada where the outlaw would be secure and that was in the Abbasin, and she knew the alhambra too well not to be sure of the route catalina's abductor would take but it was simple enough to persuade over that the man would be more likely to take an underground route escaping at the favorable moment by some opening known only to his kind the descent to the baths was on the way to the hall of the ambassadors and as she ran down the long corridor her brain whirled with the obsession of the place and she fancied herself for a moment one of the favorites who had reigned here in the days of the moorish splendor until a fairer captive threatened her own youth and beauty and love of life with a silken cord and a brief struggle in one of the chambers above over's apparent devotion during the first part of the night had roused in her all the passion of which she was capable and she could feel his hot short breath on her neck as they ran she had watched his surrender to catalina's beautiful dancing and his wild instinctive leap to her rescue with bitter jealousy and fear in a flash she had seen catalina for what she was a girl to rouse all the romantic passion in a man and in all her loveliness her ideal womanhood and her changing moods she had been his constant companion for three weeks in spain but thrust out of sight the creature of a gypsy internationally besmirched her feet turned to the threshold leading down to the moorish bath where ten minutes could be wasted but the american girl in her suddenly revolted another american girl was in hideous peril and she shuddered with disgust even more than with pity she whirled about prince she whispered you and helmholtz go down there and search but i feel sure he has gone out one of the windows and she ran on to the hall of the ambassadors they searched it at last and hung out of the windows far below a faint sound came to their ears but they could not determine its nature an instant later they heard a short but infuriated roar followed by the sharp call of a woman over was already on the other side of the window when miss holmes caught his arm don't she cried hysterically it is almost certain death he is sure to have confederates over gave her a look of haughty surprise and shook her off the frenchman thrust a pistol into his hand i never go without one here don't hesitate to shoot over groped and stumbled down the hill but with far more agility than the encumbered catalan there was no path the thick brush and rocks were everywhere and the moon made the shadows under the trees the heavier but when the thin englishman has spent the greater part of his life on his feet and out of doors he is little likely to lose his balance or skill even on a steep wilderness designed by the cunning moor as a pitfall for the enemy he was half way down when the way cleared and he saw several yards beneath him a curious stumbling figure half black half white in an instant he suspected its meaning and although he was obliged to laugh he paused and gave a sharp halloo catalina answered him with what breath was left in her 
and he heard the glad note in her broken cry he ran on but in a moment the man stopped abruptly and endeavoured once more to shake off his burden catalina leaped from his back and ran to one side bracing herself once more over aimed his pistol and fired the man gave a wild scream of pain tumbled to his knees regained his feet and fled catalina ran up the hill a few steps then suddenly exhausted leaned against a tree but over bore down upon her and when she saw his eyes she opened her arms end of chapter 25 end of the traveling thirds by gertrude atherton